With technologies on the rise and becoming more and more relevant in our society, many teachers have found that often their students have more technological knowledge than they have, and as a result, have had to rethink their teaching methods, shifting from traditional nonlinear methods such as a long novel or a basic pen and paper to more technological, nonlinear formats in order to better accommodate the needs of a generation becoming increasingly accustomed to this nonlinear style. One small problem in my point of view is that we respectful with, uh, with the incredible work that was done in the 20th century, still being done to some extent, on attempts to get uh, the screen of our consciousness down on the page. And that problem is, frequently, it's a little difficult to read the stuff. <laughs> uh, it's the old power of learning model. Uh, the discipline system. And it is what a lot of our learning system is still a lot based upon um, with your basic grammar study and the bottom until you gradually gain more and more expertise in language, rhetoric, and philosophy until you reach the pinnacle. And one person reaches the pinnacle and everyone else will gather the bits of information and as they go up in expertise. So it's a great model and as we talked about earlier when we were all know what sort of expertise it is that we're looking for. Um, if it's language expertise, then it's very easy to see if we have a, uh, if we're teaching the basics of language, of the English skills, and some people are going to become better at those skills and better at those skills, know more the specifics of how rhetoric works, how knowledge works, until there's one person up at the top. And in a discipline, this has worked very well for us in the university. Now it's the case that often the, let's say, freshman undergraduate student might be more facile with uh, computer uh, objects than a tenured professor. And uh, some professors find that condition threatening. And their response to it is to sort of draw a tight little boundary against the kind of cultural objects they'll consider in which they have established expertise and they can still be the expert. The problem comes when rhetoric expands um, beyond the, this textual based discipline, beyond the speech based discipline, and there are other elements of practice that come involved that we don't know how to incorporate into this model. Uh, back last fall, I personally became very aware of how this functioned when I was in a master's level graduate course learning the basics of how to do flash for web design. I was working also with our mass communication department in undergraduate schools, in which they were learning the basics of flash design. I also was substituting during that time period for a middle, middle school computer science class, which was learning the basics of flash design. From the master's, undergraduate, and middle school classes were all learning the exact same material. They were largely learning it from the exactly the same sources. They were using different books, but those books were all popular press books that were coming off and were teaching the basic technical skills of how to do the flash. It is clear that technologies have brought disruption to the traditional academic system and the professors that stick to traditional methods. But just how have these technologies affected students? And how do they differ from their professors? Deep attention is the mode traditionally cultivated in the humanities where one focuses on a single object, say a Dickens novel, for a long period of time, wants to exclude all kinds of external uh, stimuli, and has a very high threshold for, um, for diversion or boredom. In other words, they don't, they don't get bored reading a long uh, Victorian novel. Hyperattention, on, on the contrary, is characterized by a preference for multiple information streams, a low threshold for boredom, and the ability to switch quickly between different information streams. But I think a, a younger student from the uh, computer era might not look at the text first, might look at very different things, might focus on the music, might focus on the animation, might focus on the way uh, the words rearrange themselves, and uh, come up with a significantly different reading. With technologies and software programs becoming more and more advanced and integrated into society, 
How does this impact teachers and in what way can they utilize these technologies? So being able to critically look at all of these programs and see how they are used is something that needs to be looked at and analyzed. We need to decide where in our disciplines we need to be able to teach the use of these programs and what sort of rigor we're going to take look at using in that fashion. As teachers, ideally what we should do is start where the students are. And we can't start where the students are if we don't know what the students are doing, what they're reading, how they're writing their papers, how they're doing research. But I think, again, the uh, Academy is really lagging behind um, contemporary writing practices. And we need a much better understanding of the environments in which writing is done. question that the technology is far outpacing the ability of academia to keep up with it. So uh, Mitchell Stevens uh, in his talk was talking about some of his colleagues who forbid their students to do research on the internet or who forbid their students to ever read Wikipedia. Those seem to be examples where academia is really uh, not kept up with developments of how the new knowledge structures work. live in a world where we don't simply go to the web to draw information down, but that people are actively participating in and contributing to the knowledge and information that is on the web. That's what Wikipedia is. People write in and they share their expertise, but this happens through blogs and through many other forms. But my idea is that this is the perfect occasion for collaboration. So I, uh, for example, invited one of my very bright undergraduate students to um, do an independent study with me that was structured like this. I served as his mentor for reading Thomas Pynchon's really complex novel, Gravity's Rainbow, and he served as my mentor to go through certain computer games. And he was a wizard, and he'd do something on the screen, and I'd say, well, Andrew, how do you know how to do that? And he'd say, it's obvious. Well, it wasn't obvious to me, but uh, it was a wonderful collaborative learning experience in which I could contribute my expertise, and he could contribute his expertise, and I think we both got a lot out of that uh, independent study, much more than if we'd simply done Gravity's Rainbow. And needless to say, it also changed the power relations because it made us really a collaborative team where we each respected the other's expertise and was able to learn from it. And it seems to me, with moving images, with moving words, we're in a much better position to uh, recreate that stuff and much more we built Writer's House, and this is the room we're particularly proud of, the collaboratory. We've imagined a space where students can work on multimedia composition. Because to compose and compose successfully in the 21st century, you have to not only excel at verbal expression and written expression, but you also have to excel in the use and manipulation of images. That's what it means to compose. And while I don't think we should abandon linear argument, it's nevertheless true that for students like that, if you introduce them to hypertext writing or nonlinear writing, they find that a tremendously liberating experience. And the depth of insight they can achieve in nonlinear forms is much, much greater than that particular student can do in a linear format. So I, I think there are 
undoubtedly different modes of thinking and different ways that people think. Some people, for example, are highly visual thinkers. I'm not. I'm almost exclusively a verbal thinker. But it just goes to show that um, it, the more compositional forms we can devise to accommodate different styles of thought, uh, the richer I think those students' writings will become. Many professors and students alike have shown that technology is transforming the way people think about composition and the academic norms. With this technological revolution, it is imperative that the professors steeped in nonlinear methods integrate some of these technologies in order to not only better accommodate the students, but to benefit themselves as well. Technology has brought change to society. Now it is up to mainstream academia to respond.